happened in the 90s. Our solid antiperspirant is strong enough to stand up to even the toughest customer. But it's not for him, it's for her. Secret, with the most effective ingredient you can get to help keep you dry, cool, in control. And Secret still pH balanced to work with a woman's unique chemistry. Secret, strong enough for a man, but made for a woman. And we're yeah, good, man. How, how you feeling about the interview we did with uh, B3F? It was good, man. I, like I said, yeah. I've been fucking so fucked up with all the shit going on in my life that I went into that a little handicapped because I got bad news right before. But those guys were great. You know, I yeah. just like doing uh, anything where we can collaborate with other podcasters. It's interesting to see their setups, what they do, how they started. And uh it might not be good uh, content, but I I love having those discussions because it kind of informs us on like what we need to do, you know. Yeah. Um. I, overall, I felt good about it, man. Um. It w- it was fun chatting with those cats. Like you know, I, I I've said before, man. One of the beauties about podcasting is you can link up with people who you probably wouldn't know otherwise, man. Uh, I I didn't I don't know anybody in Tennessee or from Tennessee. I don't think. Um, I mean, I know some people in Nashville, but not Knoxville. I never, I've never even been. So it's always, I mean, it's just interesting c- to see like similarities and stuff that we do or why we started with other people. It seems like a lot of, you know, there's a lot of shared similarities um, for people that do podcasts. I think we're all a little bit crazy in the same way. Um, yeah. But it's cool. Like when you do see like what they do and like their setup and sort of the the things that we could do to elevate ours that sort of mirror what they're doing uh it's always yeah. interesting and those guys you know it's funny man i just like you know meeting new people it's cool to meet people that i could see us maybe they would have been at a party we were at in college or something you know guys we would have yeah. smoked some weed with or something in a circle uh that's always fun so always man i, I hope those guys come on here and uh, you know i'm looking forward to doing more collaborations with more podcasts it's fun yeah, definitely, man. And uh, what I'm noticing, too, like a, a lot of these or at least the ones that we've talked to so far, they're like in our age range. So there's something about that. Like uh, when we when you hit your 30s, uh, your, your mid to late 30s, it's like, you know what? Hmm. It, Somebody it, needs it, to know how miserable I am right now. Somebody needs to know this. <laughs> <laughs> That's a do. Because like, man, when, when I started over the culture, man, like I had a bitch of a girlfriend uh, and I was having struggles with employment in Houston. And it was just all of these fucking bullshit jobs that like, you know, uh, 10 years with Fox, like where else can I apply this in Houston, Texas? Oh, uh, yeah, well, you can be a, a furniture vacuumer. Uh, Houston is the, <laughs> yeah, one, exactly, right? is the number one in uh, uh, furniture and, and futon vacuuming. Uh, we're, we're the top market. Uh, so there was a lot of that shit. I couldn't apply. And so it was just like, well, fuck, I have nothing but time. And I have these ideas. And like the people out, like my friends, uh, some of them would entertain my shit. But like I, I would have other friends and cousins who were like, man, what the fuck are you talking about? Uh, uh, Tim Duncan is the Undertaker of like, what the fuck, huh? Undertaker, like, uh, uh, Big Pun is the Yokozuna of rap. Like, well, you see, hear me out, man. It's because Big Pun, he was a really good guy, but he's big, man. So he's versatile. He can do all these word plays. And but he was a fat guy. Yokozuna, he was really agile for. Fa- okay, bro. So it was like. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I see that. Seeing... I mean, just from visually, I see that anyway. But uh, yeah. I also think people of our, at least our generation, at least I know you and I both had uh, more of a creative idea of what our lives might turn into. You know, we'd like to do creative things. We more, are, I wouldn't say I'm artistic, but I don't necessarily want to go into a job and fucking hit a calculator button all the time or like type emails. You know, that's not my thing. And uh I've gotten stuck in that world and I, my only uh, escape from that was either making videos with my buddies and trying to further my film or video career or, you know, after that sort of slowed down doing shit like this. And I even put off doing a fucking podcast for years because 
it's hard to either get so I didn't want to do it by myself. So that's why I always salute you for doing that. Cause I mean, that's the ultimate, I, that to me is just like putting yourself out there at the fullest extent. And I think that's so awesome. You did that, but for me, I can never come up with a concept that was just like, you could get anybody that wasn't you into the idea of like doing it regularly, you know, being a, I know dependable people, but it was like when I would bring up, bring a podcast to them, I, I didn't really have a, any sort of concept. It was just, let's do a podcast and just talk, which now seems like, Oh, everyone's doing that, you know, but 10, 15 years ago, when I was trying to get anybody to even understand what a podcast was, nobody was doing that. And even recently, it's just hard to find somebody like you or like Aaron that is consistent and that, you know, if we schedule some, you're going to show up. Yeah. And and, and that was the thing. Wait, like, were you asking people who were like potential podcast co-hosts or were you telling like other friends and stuff too? Well, I would, uh, well, I'm, you know, 10 years ago, this kind of shit wasn't even really an idea. Like you couldn't do a zoom meeting recorded easily and then make a podcast out of that. Or maybe you could, but I wasn't aware of how to do that. So that didn't seem yeah. re- realistic. Um, Aaron and I would do it, but him and I are both very, uh, I don't want to say being hard on ourselves was the reason, but we just didn't think we were interesting enough to do a podcast. You know, I, I don't really think I'm that interesting. I, I hear other people tell me that, and I understand that. I think everybody sort of thinks that. Um, but, you know, when it was podcasting was a normal thing, uh, I had friends that did it, but it was always yeah. like, uh, for example, my buddy, Sean, he did one with a guy, I'm not actually going to say his name because the guy's a complete douche, but he, uh, mm. it was all about like tips for guys to get ladies and Sean just did it. Cause he knew the guy, <laughs> yeah. but like, it was always shit like that. And it's, I'm not doing that. You know, you don't want to yeah. get my fucking tip for the ladies. And I just don't, it's like not something I'm into. So it was always shit like that. And I could never get like Sean or anybody to, it was more me. I was just like stopping myself because I was like, nobody wants to hear my voice. I don't like hearing my voice. I think I have a, like, I don't even like that part of it. So it just took a while more for me to get over my bullshit, but also to, you know, be comfortable bringing somebody in and not feel like you're wasting their time recording a conversation. That's never going to get anybody to listen or, or anything like that. And then, you know, quickly when we got into the pandemic, it was like, fuck all that bullshit. Like, let's just get this shit down. Like, and then I sort of started thinking about it as this is kind of morbid, but, you know, I did have cancer and I almost in my mind was, I mean, I'm trying not to make this sound morbid, but like if I were to die, I always thought it would be cool that somebody could go on and now they can see my face. But, you know, my other podcast was just audio and they could hear me just like bullshitting and being myself. Yeah. Uh, and just sort of pontificating and just kind of getting a vibe for who I was. Cause if I'm not around, like, at least this is like a record that I existed, you know? Exactly, man. There's that, um, you, you have, uh, archives, you have a collection of audio and video. And like, I, I said this on the, on the B3F podcast, man. Uh, I was telling people about my ideas and stuff, whether they were potential co-hosts or just friends who were around at the time. And it, it took this one uh, chance event of my my basis of Priest of Hiroshima. We were celebrating his birthday. All the band members came and I'm telling them about my idea. And my drummer's fiance at the time, uh, she was kind of like her her attitude and her energy was kind of calling bullshit because a lot of people were talking about like, man, I want to start a podcast. Everybody wants to start a podcast. And she was just like, and I'm, I'm saying all these things I need was like, man, I, I would like to have another co-host and, you know, to bounce ideas off of. And I need this, that, and a third, a laptop. And, and she was like, no, you don't. You just need to uh, download an app and push record. And everyone else was silent. And I, it, it just seemed like, damn, she's really like owning I like at that. This table. Who is that? She's good. Well, she's, she's a genius. She, she's my drummer's um, wife now. 
uh, they would get married that same year, man. And I was just like, man, you know what? Uh, I feel like I'm being challenged. So tomorrow is going to be the day. I don't have a co-host at the moment. Uh, the people were flaking out on me. And I, I like I know that there are apps where I could push record. It might not be the greatest quality wise, but fuck it, man. I've been telling people about this enough. And I hate being that guy to be like, oh, yeah, man, I got this new invention. I got this idea for a business. I'm going to start a, a taco truck. And yeah. I was like, no, dude, do it. Do it, man. I hate because I, I, I don't like what other people do that, man, because like I have some really creative uh, friends with these great ideas. And it's just like it pisses me off and it disappoints me when years go by and they don't do it. And like I bring it up like, dude, so like what happened to that, man? And, and it's not to be antagonistic. It's like I, I like, man, like I, I don't like seeing people I care about, like just not do shit with their potential, man. Well, and I think I can, I was that guy, dude, you know, like you get out here mm -hmm. and you sort of, at least for me, like I got out to LA and it was just like getting battered around by, you know, what I thought was going to happen never did. Um, I found some creative guys and we got into a rhythm of like do, being creative. So I, I experienced that out here yeah. and I actually got like close. So I did shit, but then it's like, I fell into like this just because I was broke, I guess. And you sort yeah. of, you know, when you're in your late twenties and you're not doing the shit you thought you were going to do, it's a hard fucking thing, man. You know, some people just sort of accept it and move on. And for me, it was like, I was just, I mean, you know, I still am, I'm out here. I'm in the place where everybody does this shit. And it was like, I kept doing what you're saying, you know, even if it was, I would do something small. Like I worked with Joey Diaz. I would help other people with art on their podcast or this or that. And it was just like, I never got my shit up under me to do it until, you know, one going through cancer, but two, like the pandemic, it was like literally like two rapid fire things where it's like, well, if I keep saying I'm going to do this, like all this crazy shit keeps happening. Like I'm not going to be able to do it. You know, I'm never going to do any of this shit that I'm saying. So it's time to get the fuck off the pod in terms of doing the podcast, you know? And I, just like in terms of like the last couple of years of my life, I've just seen like when you start something, no matter what it is, it's never what you envision it being in the end. Like you and I want this thing to pop off. You and I want this to be something bigger than it is now, but we've both commented. And I'll even say this about the other podcast. When you start something, if you look at the quality of this show day one versus now, it's night yeah. and day. And that's only oh, yeah. been, I don't even like eight months you know, yeah, something man. of that nature. So, um, but I do very much understand like the sympathize with those people where that you sort of get caught just saying what ifs and I want us and I'm gonna, but you never do it, you know, fuck that man. Yeah. Fuck that. And it's, and I mean, it, it kills you. It does st like slowly just sort of like batter you down. And then when somebody like you comes around and reminds you of it, you know, a lot of people, like you said, you weren't trying to be antagonistic, but some people will take it that way. You, or you just internally, they're like, man, yeah. fuck. Like, you know, it, it just fucks you or you fucks your head up. And uh, that's why I'm glad you and I have done this. I've sort of made strides too, in my, like, in the last few years, especially in the last couple with COVID and everything that anything we got, like, just do it. I, I have a very, I've always admired Robert Rodriguez uh, simply because the guy, his best DIY. advice that I've ever taken is, use what you got around you. We all got exactly. computers, you know, we have webcams, you and I are adults. We can slowly buy maybe a mic every once in a while, upgrade those things one by one. And now we've grown a little, and I think we're going to continue to do that. But you, I always used to get stuck at the beginning being like, well, I got to do this and I got to do this. And I still do well, that, but you can't do that. You know, straight up, man. And that well, you were showing the work. So like, that was like, a no brainer, man. Um, and I've said this before, dude, like it, it's because of those frustrations of people flaking out on you. It's like, well, shit. Um, like I was, you know, kind of getting a groove and getting a hang of doing the shit with the over the culture. It was like, man, uh, I think I want to do a second one, man, because like, I, I don't know, he, he's a kind of a pariah in society, but Charlemagne the God is an inspiration to me. Um, you know, he's had his past uh, mis, mis, unfortunate misgivings and shit. Uh, but man, he's, He's I, I like to think the man has evolved and he's got like, oh, a couple I mean, if you podcasts. don't think he has, I, I, you must not be paying attention to what he's been doing, yeah. you know?
and it's because of guys like that. It's like, man, I think I can pull off a, another show, man. And like I said, you were showing me the work. Like you were consistently putting in Ain't Life Funny with Aaron, man. And I was like, well, shit, man, let me see if he has time to in, even at least entertain another show. If, if yeah. his schedule can permit, man. Well, I, honestly, um, dude, when you first brought it up, I was like, I can't do this. Like it's either yeah. I pick one or the other. And eventually we stopped doing Ain't Life Funny anyway. But I... Uh, I believe it was Kendra that was like, why don't you just do it? Like, see if you can do it, you know? And it's, I couldn't envision it. But then as soon as somebody just said that, like snapped me out of it, I was like, well, fuck, you're right. Like me and, and also you and I have been talking about doing shit, like whether it's a skit or just a funny idea, we've been yeah. always, that's kind of been our conversation. I remember uh, I was talking to my parents about this being living with them after I moved away from Ohio and then maybe it was like after I moved back to Virginia from Hollywood, but whatever, I was in like a bad place and I was in a bookstore and you mm -hmm. called me and we were talking for like hours about like these mm -hmm. like funny ideas and catching up and shit. And I even remember yeah. back then, I mean, this was a decade plus ago, uh, really? it just stuck in my head because I was out of the creative thing for a while. I was just like, I can't, I don't know even what I'm going to do with my life anymore. And uh, you sort of, You've always just been like a guy who I've uh, this is like give flowers. This is disgusting inside. <laughs> but you've always been a guy who I've always sort of looked up to because thanks, bro. Uh, with our friends group, you know, like you've sort of been a guy who's always sort of had a plan and a path. And I never really had that. You've been a guy that I've enjoyed being around because you're fun. But you've also thanks, been bro. very much more mature than I have, even though you're younger than I am. So uh, it, it, it depends. It depends. You know, I, I, I still giggle when people say titty from time to time. But, oh, I mean, know. I'm not I'm not saying that, Steve. We'll say titty <laughs> balls all day and I'll start laughing. But, you know, I'm just saying, like, in terms of that kind of stuff, you know, and you even brought this to my, you know, we talked about doing a podcast, but I mean, credit to you, you brought this concept. It could have been just us talking and while I would have thought that would be entertaining, I'm seeing that when you do have sort of a a direction that the podcast is like a uniformity to something or a theme, it does help a lot. Yeah. You know? it, it gives you something to work with, man. Um, I mean, look, look at Letterman, look at uh, our favorites, man, Conan. Uh, obviously they have stuff that's scripted man but like the off the cuff shit man the the banter between paul schaefer and david letterman the banter between conan and uh andy uh you know well, but you know they do a have a little extra time and money steve we're filming i have i'm envisioning you know we did that b3h uh thing and B it was a f B3F, sorry, B3F. I got too many podcasts in my head. I just sent an, an email to somebody else. But um, mm -hmm. they do a live thing. And my idea for you, and we've been talking about this anyway, is to, like, to make you like a Johnny Carson type guy. And I could be like an Ed McMahon. And we should just do a live thing where it could be about like the topic of the week. Like maybe we do it once a week. And it could be like hot topics of the week. And then we just write a joke or two about it, do a Johnny style and shoot it and make it like a live thing. It just, we need some camera. We need, it's going to be a little more advanced, but I've been writing some ideas down for this and seeing it done live. There, I, there's something real interesting about that. Being able to have people communicate with you and sort of add content to the show in real time. I, I like that. It scares me, but I like that. Uh, it, through Instagram or are you talking because they use something like uh, I think it was called Melon. Yeah, it was. It's a, yeah. like, you know, it's uh, there's many service. Streamcast is another one, but there's many mm -hmm. services that offer that. And uh, I'm going to get in touch with that Joey guy. Um, we invested in Zoom, but I think we could invest like, you know, once everything gets figured out a little bit more, uh, that could be something that we do to add to it. I, I like that aspect of it because it can sort of add content that you're not even planning on just by having some people watch you live. You know, it'd be interesting. Yeah, yeah man, that, that's definitely in the works, man. <laughs> I, I like to get that uh before the end of the month, man, um, let, let's uh, do our homework and see the best route, because that, that's something I've been thinking about for the last couple months, man. When we first started talking about live and implementing live shit into our show. Um, and I, I think that would be interactive. 
it, it would allow us to uh, talk to the people directly, man, the people that are already following us. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, people do Twitch streams and play video games all the time and they're just sitting there talking to people and make, you know, I'm not really thinking about this in terms of a money maker, other than I always am thinking about how to make money off of a business. But, um, right. you know, if if little kids can figure out how to do Twitch streams while showing their video games and like, a, you know, if they can do that, we can definitely do that. You know, I have a film background. If I can't figure that out, I need to just stop. So, yeah. These fucking new millennials are fucking taking over the world. These kids. Well, hey, boys and girls, this is Steve G and Matt G with Happened in the 90s, a show where we talk about things that happened in the 90s. So get out your Jodeci tapes and your talk, boys, and sing, Say, everybody, have you seen my boss? They're They're big big and salty and brown. brown. If you ever need a big, quick, pick me up. Just just stick stick my my balls balls in your mouth. In your mouth. Dude, rest in peace, Isaac Hayes. Suck on my chocolate salt in 90s. Suck it, 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 suck it. Dude, know. legendary. I'll, you're not going to be singing back up anytime soon, Steve, but it's okay. No. I love it. <laughs> in Vogue, Wayne shall call me. No, you're never gonna get it. Not loving. No, you're never gonna get it. Not this time. I could have been the not this time guy. That would have. Mm, bop. Ooh. All right. Yeah, we're talking about salty Joe balls. See, get this guy. Somebody call Joe to see up right now. If they needed like a backup or something or like a, a stand in, whatever. I don't know. Just make you understand me. <laughs> I don't give a damn about nothing else. Freaking you is all I need. Tonight, I want your body. I want your body. It's like, that, it's like that episode of Martin where he he, sh- he like shows up to sing with Casey and Jojo at the in LA. Like Casey, Jojo. Devonte Swain, <laughs> fucking uh, what was it uh, with Tommy Davidson? Um, uh, Varnell Hill. It's the Varnell Hill show. Shaboing boing. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Varnell Hill show. Boing boing. What did, he said like man tan in that shit too. That was oh, like a it's a, <laughs> it's a Varnell Hill man tan. Shaboing boing. On the Varnell Hill show. It's the Varnell Hill show. Did you miss me? <laughs> hey, rerun. How many times have I invited you over my house? Dozens of times. And what would actually happen if you came to my house? I would get sprayed. <laughs> exactly. I have a car that lets me travel the world, meet fascinating people, and have great adventures. Absolutely free. It's my library card. Drop by your local library and check it out. <laughs> and we're talking about chocolate salty balls we're talking about mike Tyson coming out of jail and peeing down peter mcneely we're gonna be talking about blank man mm, yeah that, this shit's i mean we said it was a late week but just those three things steve there's it's just happening this week august 19th in the 90s was just it's a day it's a day that will we'll, we'll live in infamy in 90s infamy at least no doubt man uh, because, like I said, in 1994, on August 19th, Blank Man premiered. It's a simpleton inventor who becomes a superhero with a bulletproof costume and a low budget. Starring Damon Wayans, David Allen Greer, ah, Robin Givens, Lynn Thigpen, R.I.P., John Polito, R.I.P., and Jason Alexander, my favorite of the Steinfeld cast. I mean, he's the goat of the Seinfeld cast. I mean, people yeah, okay. would have said Kramer probably 12 years ago just because of the, the, the he was the guy. I never understood that either. I never was a Kramer yeah. guy, even as a Seinfeld watcher. So I didn't get that. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry to sidetrack <laughs> Sally funny. right away. But no, nah, we going to get on some Michael Richards because fuck him. And let me show you this, bro. I got something the other day that I didn't get to show our new friends with B3F. I went to. The GameStop, after I got my hair cut, boom, boom, boom. Oh, Costanz. Nice. Yeah. Costanza can't stand you. And 
I like you whenever you go to GameStop, those motherfuckers always try to upsell you. Like, oh man, if for five, if you get the membership, you you get five dollars. You get a free pop every month. Like, dude, I don't show up here uh, like that, man. I buy one game, like if that, per year. Yeah. Um, and and I was like, man, I hope you bring up Kramer. I hope you mention Kramer because I just want to shit on some Michael Richards. And he was like, man, yeah, dude, uh, I, I got the whole cast, man. I even got the uh, Kramer, man. He's my favorite, man. Get I got that shit one. out of here. <laughs> yeah, and, and I was just like, because he was like, man, I even have the. Uh, they, they even have the Kramer painting pop. And I was like, man, look, bro, I don't care about Kramer. And he started going to some Michael Richards. I was like, no, this even outside of the Michael Richards shit, Kramer was just never funny to me. And like, this is the most abrupt that our conversations, because it's always the same guy. And he's yeah. always, he will not let me leave. And so after I said the Kramer shit, he, I, he, I don't know. He was just like, oh, okay. I got to go. Because I was going to bring out a bunch of other Kramer. I have his outfit. I bought his outfit off Michael Richards, no less. <laughs> yeah, one uh, one day uh, for Halloween, man, I even got his haircut. Why, why? <clears throat> I got his set list from his comedy show that one night, and all it is is just the N word over and over again on the page. <laughs> uh, you fucking hack comedian! I hate you, Michael Richards. Yeah, things are a little uh, bit harder when Larry David and Jerry Seinfeld are writing your words for you, huh? Yeah, God, dude, sure. that, that was such a wild ass thing. Like, and the amount it, it just was to hear what comedians were saying about it and just like how that all happened. What, I mean, what a fucking in like 20 minutes, that guy went from a television legend, like a character that everyone remembered. People had that fucking painting, all that shit yeah. to, Ooh, like he got back. They put him on uh curb your enthusiasm, but I feel like even then it's not like widely talked about because I mean, that was a Seinfeld reunion, and you don't really hear that much about that season. You know, what unless I mean? you're a fan of the show, you have yeah. to follow them to know and like get it. And it's like, bro, you even have Paul Mooney of all people co-signing for him on David Letterman. It's like that still does. Like, bro, you're done. You had Jerry Seinfeld come up with you, and it's just like we love Jerry, we love Paul Mooney, but man, Michael Richards, you're not a comedian. It's a video. A like it ain't like he wrote some shit. It's like you can't come back yeah. from that, dude. That that's a video that instantly went viral and it ain't even like questionable. Like, well, the tone of what he was saying was a joke. It was there was no question and it was just a whole lot of fucked up shit going on. So it's just like, I don't know, man. You you always don't want to have anybody just have their career taken away. But that motherfucker wasn't a joke. He just that came out of him. So it's like, good luck coming back, dude. Even with all those heavy hitters that you said, crickets. You could probably get a Dude. cameo from that guy for like 10 bucks. Hey, for you budding stand-up comedians out there, or for you actors who <laughs> want to be stand-up comedians, hey, do your homework first. Because a lot of people, and I think you've hinted on this in a previous episode, where like somebody who's known, uh, like somebody that's a celebrity, whether they're like an Instagram person, they make those skits and shit. They have a rude awakening when they try stand up comedy because being a funny person and being good at stand up completely different things, man. Uh, you just think you can go up there and just do your shtick because I'm sure that's what he was doing. He was doing his his Kramer's feel, <laughs> and it's like, no, nah, bro, like this ain't this isn't a sitcom. This is a. Uh, Five minutes, 10 minutes, or even I don't know how long that asshole was up there where well, you have to have jokes after jokes after jokes, man, because let's say you kill with that joke. They're going to be like, all right, what's next? Yeah, that's what you that's, you wait, that's what people would say about Kramer. It was like you he'd get up there and even like, let's take what you like the end bomb night away from it. Like he'd get up, he'd do a bunch of pratfalls, like physical comedy, like trip on a cord. And it's like. Okay, Kramer's here. Like, what else? Like, I've seen all this. Like, this ain't funny. You know, I'm in a, you know, you ain't saying shit. So, you know, clearly he was just like one of the victims of that. And, you know, I, I always like think it's wild that people that do TikTok videos or YouTube celebrities, credit to them for being successful because that in and of itself, I, we don't even understand and we're trying it. You know, like there's things that we don't get about. It's very hard. So I do give them very much a lot of credit oh, yeah. for that. But to think oh, yeah. that you can do something where you're editing the video, you're writing it out, you're per you're honing it to as hard of an edge as you can to make it as good as possible when you're making a video, you don't yeah. got that opportunity in stand-up. You get up on stage, no. and even if you're off that night, 
or somebody's looking at you weird and you react to that or like the it sounds off. There's a million things that can throw you out. And if those people don't think you're funny, you're just standing there. When you make an unfunny video, you're not yeah. watching the people go. Exactly. Fuck? You know, or just being like, boo, a, a thumbs down on our videos could give a fuck. You know, yeah. but if I'm in if I'm in front of a co comedy club and I'm like just bombing, I mm -hmm. I've never done it, but I can't imagine that I would survive. I'd probably go home and hang myself. Um, I, I when, when I first tried stand up my first night, man, I bombed so bad. I stayed up for the rest of that night. And I I, I did the, I did it the right way. One of my female friends who lived in my apartment complex, I had her come over so I could do it like the right way. And I killed. I was like, you know what? Fuck this. I'm going back to that bitch. And I ain't going to be nervous. I'm going to get me a little bit of more liquor in me, some fucking in my system. Uh, and I'm going to have some of my buddies come and like, I'm going to do this shit like I planned, man. And uh, yeah, dude, like. He is a comedic actor. Uh, and I, like me and you, we love Will Ferrell, but I feel like he is the same deal. Like if he did stand up, unless he was in Ron Burgundy as a character, um, I think that could kill. But if he just approached it like a Chris Rock or like a Bill Burr, like, it, bro, you're Will Ferrell. We, we know you for skits. <clears throat> Stay in Plus, your lane. It's will Ferrell will do live speeches that are funny, but it ain't like nightly comedy. And like he's that's been written like a movie. You know, that's produced and like happens the same way a movie would, you know. So yeah. the fact like you went back, Steve, like for me, I kind of experienced the same thing. I did it. I've talked about this. Like I went on stage and I I know I didn't black out, but I don't have any memory of being on stage. I just remember getting on, coming off and being told I did OK. But the rest of the night, because I'd done that, my heart, I was so energized. I didn't sleep. Yeah. I talked my girlfriend at the time's ear off and I just didn't sleep that night. So I remember that. I I mean, I vividly remember like that day and the day before because I didn't I did the bits to my girlfriend, yeah. but she was uh, uh, bad. It was just not a good time. Steve. Studio apartment. It was as bad as a stand up mic or an open mic comedy audience like it was even worse because she didn't like me at the time. So I was just, you know, she wasn't going to laugh. It, it was like the beginning of Joker. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, even sadder than that, actually. You know, the misery was definitely there. But uh, I didn't go back. Like, I was just like, ah, this wasn't I, I didn't kill. And I guess like in my head, if I would have left there and it would have been like, ah, this guy's the next fucking Seinfeld, which is never going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it just didn't happen that way. So I just got scared, but you did it the right way. And I, I just respect anybody, at least try it. Like, I, I do think I'd like to try it again. We've talked about doing like live podcasts. So I think that'd be an easier way for us to eat, at least me to ease back into it. Cause I'd have you with me and we'd be doing something together, but um, no. it's hard, man. But fuck Kramer. Yeah. I don't give that guy well, any passes. He was a professional. He's been like, my thing about people like that is you should at least be able to get up on stage and be cool with like the limelight because that's your job anyway. Yeah. Whether or not, you know, when you're on a film set or a movie set, people don't laugh. They're just working. So when you, you should be used to jokes, not really getting a reaction because that's what it is. But I don't, I don't remember what was said initially right before he went into his tirade, but I guarantee it was some bullshit anyway. That's why those people were going like, boo, fuck you, Kramer, and we're heckling. And, and dude, you got to be prepared for that because that's a part of the job, man. And like there are videos on YouTube where like comedians are just taking over because you like this is your stage for that moment. So if somebody's calling you out and trying to take the attention away, it's up to you to own it and just be like, all right, I'm going to flip this shit and put the spotlight on you since you want to be the star. And like there are like some of the greats have done it from Bill Burr, Patrice O'Neill, Chris, like. I mean, Bill Burr did it to a whole fucking city. You know, the whole city. I mean, that's the most famous one of the most famous comedy bits of all time. Yeah. But I mean, that's the thing about that's why I like hearing stand up comedians talk about the just what they do and like the coming up and becoming a good stand up comedian, because getting heckled, doing shitty rooms, figuring out like what to do when somebody heckles you. 
That's what you yeah. do in like the first 10 years of being a stand up comedian so that when you are a Bill Burr, you can get up on stage and you're dead inside and you know exactly how to handle somebody that's trying to talk over you or do yeah. something. That's just part of the job. And obviously people like Kramer, they don't have that because that's one yeah. thing that doesn't happen on a TV set is people don't fucking heckle you. They just don't react. Yeah. Um, so you can that's why probably he overreacted and did what he did but that also just showed you inside what that dude's like because that's not like he can't say oh that's just was an act like to me it's just like dude you just panicked and the real you came out bro the real you came out man the the funniest thing that fucker's done was the andy kaufman bit well him and a younger larry david they were on that nbc show called uh friday night or some shit like that it was like a snl like that where they had bits and shit and Andy Kaufman was supposed to be uh, the, the host of the show or the, the, the guest. And he basically broke the third wall. And Michael Richards, he went along with it. Uh, like now they're saying that Michael Richards was in on it. But he was basically Andy Kaufman was like, man, I can't do it. And then everybody was like, what the fuck? What are you doing? And he jumps out of character. And then it, they end up getting into a fight. Like, dude, what the fuck? Like, dude, we're li-. <laughs> but that was the funniest shit because it's Andy Kaufman. Has less to do with Michael Richards. <clears throat> My only thing that I ever liked that Michael Richards was in was Problem Child, where he played a pedophile thug, which seems right. And then um, he was in a movie called Airheads that might not be the best movie, yeah. but I it's just like one of those classic 90s movies. I'm sure hopefully we'll talk about it one day because it does have Chris Farley. It's got a Brendan Fraser. It's got Adam Sandler and it's got Steve Buscemi. So it's got a lot of legends. And he's also one of those people as well. So, well, hate to break it to you, but that premiered two weeks ago. God when, damn uh, it. Well, you yeah. know what? Shout out to Airheads because that movie is that shit. Yeah, man. Uh, you know, how, we we went from blank man to Michael Richards. Yeah, man. motherfucker uh, sidetracked the, all exactly. the way out. So yeah, August nineteenth, blank man premiered. What year was it, Steve? <laughs> In ni- nineteen ninety four, man. 94. And it, it had a star studded cast, man. Damon Wayans, David Allen Greer, the Dag Man, Robin Givens, uh, Lynn Thigpen, John Polito, Jason Alexander. And uh, I mean, do you remember this movie a lot? Because I'll be honest with you. I remember watching this a couple times, not being thrilled with it, but I don't remember like why. And when I watch it now, I really enjoyed it. it, it it's a, a good 90s movie, but I didn't watch it as a kid growing up, like when it first came out. I remember it when it came out, but, uh, you know, I I don't know. It just hadn't reached my, my, my plate. And, yeah. um I'm a fan of like all the people I mentioned, man. And like it has Robin Givens, who is a, a 90s hottie. Uh, mm-hmm. I know she's crazy as cat shit, but that don't mean I don't want to put my thing in her. And, um, you know, <laughs> ironically, you we're going to be talking about. Steve, are you willing to take that? She's like out of Kim Kardashian vibe where if you put the di- if you dip your pen in that ink, well, you know, sometimes that shit goes bad. It seems like a lot of these guys have had some bad t- times with Robin Givens. So they, they they have. But uh fun fact about Robin Givens, Brad Pitt used to smash and he seems to be all right. Um, Yeah, dude. Damn, so, Brad, dude, uh, Brad Pitt, bro. Congratulations for just being just having the ultimate life from eight from your whole life. I think it has to be the motherfuckers just been a stud his whole fucking life. And it pisses yes. me off, Steve. Son of a bitch. And like, okay, so being a, a Mike fanatic, I watched his monologue that Spike Lee directed where he's telling his whole life story. And uh, around the time uh, when he divorced Robin or they were separated, he said he went home. He went to their house uh, to, to get some of his stuff or whatever. And when he got there, a young Brad Pitt was sitting there on the couch with Robin Givens and because they were going over lines. I don't know what movie or what production they were part of, but they were like rehearsing together. And he didn't like, he, he just knew that he couldn't compete. This is Mike Tyson. He was like, uh, Oh, he wanted to fuck. That's what it was. He wanted to come back and get some pussy. Cause even though they were separated, he was like, they were still smashing. Fucking so Iron Mike, of course. Yeah, so he went to the house thinking he was going to get some trim, and this is a young Brad Pitt sitting on the couch, and he was just like, man, I went from rock hard to being a wet noodle. His words. Because uh, he just knew, like, dude, I, I it's Brad Dude, Pitt, how, man. how much was Brad Pitt shitting his fucking pants that, and, like, when Mike yeah. Tyson was like, oh, shit. R- right, I would. <laughs> 
but I guess he stood strong. But credit to Brad Pitt again. He, did he run away? No, he probably fucking hit it that night. He probably like went over thing. a few lines that night, if you know what I'm talking about, Steve. Yeah. And Mike was probably going over a few lines. Yeah, well, he was going himself, over man. a lot more than two lines, that's for sure. <laughs> Shit, man. <laughs> but dude, shout out to Lynn Thigpen, man. She uh RIP, she was the uh the voice from Carmen San Diego, another yep. 90s show. And uh she was uh more famous for her role in the Warriors. She was uh she was like the uh the radio, the DJ. Uh well, she very she has much very, has that voice, dude. She has like iconic. a you know a voice for radio, but she's a beautiful woman too. So I yeah. mean, yeah, but I noticed her. I was like, I it took me a while to be like Carmen San Diego. That's what I recognize her from immediately. But to me, this movie is just like, it's a great, it's not affiliated with any superheroes. It's obviously not a superhero superhero, but it was just very much like one of these first movies where they tried it. It's a comedy. And it, to me, they pulled off like a, a modern day Adam West Batman. That's what they were going for. Yeah. And, uh, I thought I'm just again, like I didn't remember this movie being this good, but I think I just had different tastes when I was a kid. You know, I think maybe I was expecting more, but like I in my memory, Damon Wayans was actually mentally handicapped. <laughs> and see, that's what I thought. I thought it was going to be a handyman made into a movie, but it's, yeah. it, it's it has nothing to do with handyman. Um, He's actually a genius. He's just like, uh, what is it? Not autistic. Um, a big dork. No, those people, it's like uh, Asperger's. It seems like he has Asperger's, like where they like are geniuses, but they don't know how to interact with society correctly. You know, he's like very much just live with his mommy or his grandma the whole his whole life, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, the opening scene, it's a young Daryl and Kevin and they're watching Batman uh, like a lot of young kids at that age. And uh, Daryl and Kevin are actually played by Damon Wayne's sons, a young Damon Wayne's Jr., um and oh, wow. this is Damon yeah this is Damon Wayans Jr this is his film debut I mean I was I remember when we were watching it I said man they really cast the young kids well because they look a lot like the adults you know I don't yeah. maybe it was a haircut or whatever but that's makes sense I mean if you got a junior put him in the fucking movie you know fuck yeah man you hear that LeBron you hear that Michael <laughs> Jordan uh then I mean, it's obvious because Damon Wayans Jr., just like his dad, they have like those elf like ears. Yep. So they, they literally stand out. And I can relate to that, man. It was a good time in the 90s for us big eared brothers from Martin Lawrence to Will Smith, Damon Wayans. Yeah, man. They, <clears throat> those guys gave me inspiration. Was, you know, they did. <clears throat> hey, man. I mean, I don't think you have really crazy ears, but hey, I guess whatever you got to do to feel good about yourself. And yeah, they, you can see Damon's ears behind you. He definitely has those Tony Dungies, you know, <laughs> the Barack Obamas. Uh, now, look, um, but but in the, in the beginning of the movie, Daryl and Kevin. So Daryl is basically going to be blank man when he grows up and Kevin is his brother. And I think he's older, I believe, by a little bit. Maybe not. Maybe I'm reading too much into that, but they're living with their grandma. And their grandma is, uh, of course, the lady from Carmen San Diego. But there you can see who they're going to become. Daryl is like very much like this kid who's very inventive. He's he can sort of fix the TV with these weird contraptions. He's got very much like a young dad from Gremlins. Like you could see him inventing all mm. these stupid fucking like a Swiss Army knife that has a shaver, like shit like that. But he's in the yeah, ghetto. Yeah. So it's just like tin foil and, you know, whatever loose VCR parts he can get. And they. I believe they're trying to get like TV reception and he hooks it up to the toilet somehow and they flood the apartment and then granny gets the fucking get the switch out. Boom. Get that bam, back of the hand pow. out. And then we cut yeah. to blank man again, 90s movie, great theme song, very uh probably a good soundtrack if you actually listen to it. I don't know. Oh yeah. Um it's a, a lot of early 90s hip hop. I just and like all the style, they just pulled this off. Like to me, it's just not given a lot of credit. It's a, I don't, I didn't see who, I think Mike Binder directed this and that guy is like a comedy director, but this feels to me like um, maybe uh, Wayne's brothers attempt at almost like spoofing the superhero genre before it was even like a real thing in movies, you know, like this yeah. was their spoof, like their scary movie for superheroes almost. 
Well, no there way. was a movie that came out two years prior in, I believe, 92 or 93, uh, Meteor Man with Robert Townsend, yeah. which was kind of, the, I mean, it wasn't exactly the same, but it was a black guy who was just like, you know, the run of the mill, just, you know, a nine to five dude. And uh, he gets these superpowers, man. And um, I hope we get to talk about that because I actually like that one. Um, that one had, I mean, I just remember the box and like they had all the people in the movie and it was yeah. just like their headshots and it was yeah. just, that was most it's, of the fucking box, you know? Yeah, because it, it was just a star-studded cast, man, from uh, uh, Robert Townsend to Marla Gibbs from the Jeffersons to Bill Cosby was even in it. I was going to uh, say, another- Cosby was definitely in that one, for sure. Yeah. I mean, they were doing uh, these, uh, this, but this one, they had a lot of like great comedy. They had a lot of in living color talent. Um, they got fucking Jason Alexander, who I didn't remember this, but we cut now in this movie after the, the intro scene, we cut to them as adults. And uh, Kevin, um, Daryl's brother, is a, a cameraman, I believe, at a local like tabloid journalism channel called Hard, Hard Edge. Hard, yeah, something. Something. And Daryl is uh, working at a, I believe, like some sort of uh, repair center for appliances and inventing crazy ass, weird, ghetto ass fucking inventions also in the back of this place. Um, they're still living with their grandma. Not great, but I, that's never Metro, a good look. They're living in a fictional city called Metro City that very much just looks like New York City. And apparently it's just as expensive to live because they're still living with their grandmother. So not great. Um, we, uh, you know, shit's bad in the city. It's uh, like they live in the ghetto. People are just getting beat up. Robbed. Selling crack. Yeah, selling some crack, you know, doing the, the usual ghetto shit. Even grandma's out there, like, looking out the window, watching people get robbed, throwing glass bottles at people, trying to do some shit. Um, and uh, basically, the reason it seems like the city's going to shit, oh, you know, it's a big city, but there's a gangster in town. His name's Michael Minnelli. And this motherfucker is, John like, Polito. who played this guy? I don't have a name, but this was this John was Polito. the guy. Yeah, John Polito. He was in a lot of those uh, Cohen brother movies, man. Big Lebowski and yeah. Uh, wow. <laughs> yeah, the guy he was in the the guy in the purple bug in Big Lebowski, right? Like the PI. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, he John Polito is he was publicly gay. And it, they mentioned in IMDb that uh, Jason Alexander's character asked him, "Is he gay?" And John Polito shoots him. Uh, I don't know. I find that interesting. Oh man, dude, what do the sex noises sound like when John Polito's fucking? Because his he's got a gravelly voice. Yeah, and uh, he he had like a ro- Doctor Robotnik mustache too. It was yeah, just like yeah, he very kind much of- was built to play like it was either him or Bob Hoskins. It'd be like if you needed an English gangster, get Bob Hoskins. Yeah, you need a, a, Italian, Ita- I guess. Get this guy. So. And uh, yeah, I mean, he passed away in 2016 at the age of 65, man. Uh, he's born and raised in uh, Philly, good old Philly. Oh, and, wow. um, yeah, dude, he was in a lot of shit, man. He was in uh, The Freshman. He was in Barton Fink, Miller's Crossing, uh, The Rocketeer, Blank Man, The Crow, Hudsucker Proxy, uh, Homeward Bound 2, The Big Lebowski, um, Stuart Little. Yeah, he's I mean, he a- was just one of those career guys like. Um- Patrick Thomas O'Brien, where, you know, PTO had a, he was the nerd. This guy was kind of like the crime boss or like the mid-level scumbag. Like in The Crow, I think he owned like a pawn shop and Mm. was like connected. You know, he's just like a a greasy guy in the city type guy, you know, which very much fits for this movie because he's just like a greasy, really sort of a brutal fucking mobster because he's in the city. Um, One thing that uh, the grandmother of Daryl and Kevin uh, that she's heavily involved in is local politics for uh, the mayor or a mayoral candidate. Um, And uh, Michael Minnelli and his crew walk in. 
uh, to this, you know, mayoral office where they're doing stuff for the election and they sort of try to do the, the mob thing, you know, like, it would be a shame if you didn't get some insurance, you know, like, it'd be a yeah. shame if this place burn up. That That's kind way of too good. <laughs> you know, yeah, man. And she fucking like is real. She calls says he has a little dick. You know, she's <laughs> like all over this guy and Manelli leaves. Uh, but and, then uh, later that night, um, Granny and a couple of the the other crew for the mayor, the mayor guy, they're counting money like donations. And Manelli yeah. comes back in, or one of his thugs come back in and just shoots the fucking place up, which was and, a, and the, fucking insane as fuck, dude. That escalated real quick. And the crazy <laughs> shit. Okay, so <laughs> the guys who are taking the money. They're wearing masks, which is like, okay, taking money, that's bad, but it's a petty crime. The guy who comes in and does the spraying, hey, he's just open face. It's like, yeah, uh, <laughs> Michael Minnelli wants to send his best regard. <laughs> <laughs> he's just, da, da, just da, da, plain da, da, face. Da, da, da. I mean, so they're the going to be who, dead, Steve. I, I, like, I don't think there were cameras there, but... There, there weren't, but it's just like, why, why, why did the guys who took the money wear the mask anyway? Then if the guy who's going to commit the crime, 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 he's just plain face. Like, yeah, I just got a black T-shirt on. It's like, ah, what was the point of the mask? I mean, oh, I got white give kids. a I, fuck, Steve. He's a real boss Gambino. You know what I'm saying? He doesn't. He was just there to spray. And this guy, I like the I like if I have if I if I'm in the mob, I want this guy because he don't give a fuck. He just went in. He's an old lady, sure. He murders he murders grandmas. He don't give a fuck. <laughs> I mean, even Scarface wasn't gonna kill a lady and her kids. You know what I I'm saying? Told him, no kids, man. You go to hell, you fucking cocksucker. <laughs> so so now we're you know, Daryl and Kevin, who've been living with their grandma this whole time. And that's like their rock. They're robbed of that. Um, yeah. You know, they they bury their mother. There's no talk like if uh, like if I'm them, I'm going at the mayor saying like, are we, we going to get any compensation here? Because we're our grandma died for your support. So, you know, Dude, there's none I, of that. They go back to their apartment and they're stuck in Metro City. And I mean, they're just like, I mean, what are you going to do at this point? It's so bad. Your grandma just got shot up. So I, I'd be like, we got to get out of here, but not these guys. Um, and Kevin, Kevin is pissed, man, because he's like, you know, his mom, his grandma got murdered and he, his whole life, he's just been a pushover. He's been like this geeky ass dude uh, with these fucking spectacles that are broken. And he just, dude, he had enough, man. So they're on the train and an old lady is getting mugged. And, you know, he, he's hearing him. He, he's hearing her in the background. And he's just like, you know what? Enough of this, man. So he takes the mugger, fucking pushes him out of the fucking drain. And, you know, that this is a, a step in, in the right direction for Kevin, man. And even it's the like, lady on the train. And I've been in these situations where some crazy shit's going on in a subway and you're just like eyes forward. Like, don't look at it. So nobody's yeah. helping this old lady. So that's why Daryl steps in. And even the old lady's like, thank you, young man. And fuck y'all else. If not, didn't do shit. So okay, obviously the city, there's no heroes. So Daryl wants to become a hero, you know? It's Daryl. Okay, so I got him mixed up. Yeah, Kevin's okay. Kevin's the other guy. He's, <laughs> he's David Allen Greer. He's literally yeah. the other guy. So that's yeah. the name of his character. But um, so Daryl, he does that. And even Kevin's with him. And I think like, he, he I don't remember specifically, but he, even he's like, damn, like, holy shit. This Because yeah. to me, like Daryl slash blank man, almost comes off in like this rain man esque. He's like, you know, he's so nerdy where it's like, how does this guy exist? Yeah. He's even getting pushed around by this like twatty guy who he works for at the appliance store. He's trying to invent like a, a mobile fly catcher. That's like a, a, a bottle of raid. That's like connected to a drone of some kind. And even like this yeah. little douchey white guy's like, what is that? Like, let's get out of here. You're fine. So he gets fired for making inventions. Um, he's trying to do his good, like whatever. And like, I think even in the process of getting fired, he knocks over just a bunch of rando chemicals. And that mixture actually creates like a, an indestructible compound that can be put under like clothes. I mean, this guy's about to be a trillionaire. You know what I'm saying? Like, if he can figure this out. This is way before Jeff Bezos. Oh, dude. I mean, fuck Jeff Bezos. Goddamn, like, uh, Dick Cheney would have been calling this guy 
immediately to fucking like put this shit on army shit immediately. You know what I'm saying? So uh, he, he gets fired, but um, all while, you know, that's not good. He, they need this job because they got to pay for this apartment. So Kevin is going to work at this place that Jason Alexander is like the head guy. It's this journalism job. Um, it's called hard, hard, hard edition. It's like a tabloid show. And Jason Alexander is very much just about, you know, uh, whatever. If it bleeds, it leads type shit. They don't give a fuck about if the story's true. They even have a dartboard in the place where if you can't think of a story, you just throw darts. And it's like a subject, a verb and something else. So he's like, oh, this fucking story about uplifting the, the community. Fuck all this. We need a story about naked nuns sucking an alien's dick get on that and that's the type that's, of place you know i think that's how a lot of fox sitcoms are started i've i mean i think didn't south park say family guy was basically written by like manatees doing that i think that was basically the thing so maybe this is a real uh journalistic uh tactic but you can see kevin wants to actually be a journalist yeah. he doesn't want to work for jason alexander he wants to do real stories which the hottie journalist who works upstairs at the real news station, Robin Givens, I believe her name is Kimberly Johns and she's hot, Steve. And, uh, you know, not only is David Allen Greer complete, just like he falls to pieces or he's, he's a nerd. Uh, he's looked down upon in the building because he works in this like sub basement for this like shitty TV's channel that's talking about like Britney Spears upskirt shots and shit. He's on the ground level. Yeah. <laughs> he's below ground. He's not even on the ground level. They put him in the sewer. So and, and he was living with his grandma, man. I mean, you're trying to get with Kimberly Johns, spelled with a Z. Get his Kimberly Johns, man. With you got a Z on you know, you gotta step your game up, Dag. <laughs> at least get a car or something something like you can't show up to granny's house like you want some leftovers she cooked and let's sneak into the bat you know i i've never had to do that as like an adult like sneak around my parents to get some pussy but i can't imagine that that's ever an easy task that's just adding a layer of fucking shittiness to it but he 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 has like a little game and in their interactions he tries to like be like a, a cool guy and he gets her attention. Like, I think he even gives her a card at one point. Um, yeah. So there you see that he's not really happy with his job, and, but he is a good guy. And he's trying to sort of do something more with his life, too. So in the midst of all the turmoil, um, Daryl has conceived of this chemical that is, again, indestructible. Like if you put it on clothing and put a knife to it, it bends the knife. So I don't know yeah. what you call this, but. This he's like, I want to be a superhero. What can I do? So he you see behind him, he starts soaking his clothes in this chemical, which <clears throat> he might be a superhero for a few years, but he's probably going to get leukemia because there's some happening here. I don't I wouldn't feel comfortable just putting chemicals on myself like this. But um, without anybody knowing, he basically makes these super suits and Kevin comes home and he does like this whole unveiling. He's like, I'm a superhero now. I'm going to go yeah. fight crime. Even though um, he, you know, Kevin's like, you can't do this. Cause I think also something we glossed over was, you know, he threw that guy off the train, but then he tried to like storm a crack house, you know, just, yeah. to, you know, take him down. But, it, you know, he was pulled away because Kevin's like, what are you going to be a vigilante? Like, you can't do that. So that's yeah. sort of what, you know, got them into this mode, basically. These people are selling crack in my neighborhood. <laughs> we got to get them, Kev. Come on. And, but, you know, at one point he's fighting off this tough that is uh, like beating up bums or whatever. So he tried to save the day then. And then the bum shoots or the guy shoots him. Uh, but his his suit is bulletproof. And then the bums are suggesting, yeah, why don't you just shoot him in the head? Yeah, <laughs> shoot him in the head. Because, yeah, some of the best advice comes from bums. But before <laughs> he gets to shoot him in the head, David Allen Greer busts into the scene and, and busts out some uh, kung fu from Dag, some Dag Fu, if you will. And it, it, like, where did this come from? Like, all of a sudden, you're Jackie Chan? What the fuck? Took a, I uh, mean, they mentioned a karate class, but this motherfucker must be in like 10 years deep because he's straight up. Yeah. I mean, he takes on a whole fucking uh, a gang of bikers, I think. Yeah. Biker That's, pimps, okay. I think. 
Yeah, it, it was a, a, a mesh. Uh, they were they were <laughs> crackheads that were bikers and uh, yeah, gangsters. <clears throat> I don't know. And too bad Kimberly Johns didn't see that because that would have made those pennies moist if she saw those roundhouse kicks and sweeps on the Liu Kang side of the game. And he doesn't like he literally just like they beats him up, they go away. But like even he, like he doesn't even say anything. Like what the fuck is going on with this bulletproof shit? He just eats yeah. that, beats him up, and then they leave. Yeah, like um, we just gonna pretend like this, you ain't wearing this fucking Fred Sanford Long John suit. I and I, like instantly I'd be like, I guess you are a fucking superhero, dude. What the fuck? But you know yeah. he gets him back, and I think he like chastises him. Like what the fuck are you doing, man? Yeah, you look I mean, straight up though. Look at his face mask. That ha- that's bulletproof, but you got a lot of dome above that. That's just about to get sliced out with the bully. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like a headshot is all it would take, man. All that other shit below is null and void. I mean, so credit to the bums for just really realizing, like they put it together quick. So they must have been, you yeah. know, they weren't. They needed a fix. They were pretty sober at that point, but. They, you know, Daryl, basically, this is where his um, career as blank man starts. He's not blank man yet. He doesn't have a name. He's just no. this guy. He's, he looks like yeah. crazy crackhead Larry. You know, this this very much just looks like some guy I see walking around L.A. on a daily basis, you know? Yeah. But they um, they keep, you know, that happens. And then uh, later, like, I, th- I forget, there's a little bit of just story in there. But then, uh, you know, Blank Man is ready to go. And uh, the next day or soon thereafter, they get a call where uh, there's a, like a woman in an elevator. She's stuck in an elevator. So there's a, here's another chance for a Blank Man and Kevin at this point. He just get, he's there, too, uh, yeah. to help out. So they go over. Um Daryl puts his he get up on Kevin goes and this woman in the uh, the elevator's pregnant. She's about to pop. That's not great. So yeah. they're down there. So blank man shows up and he you know, he's invented all these gadgets. He's very much just like a ghetto ass bla- uh, inspector gadget, <laughs> like Batman, you know, like Batman has all these fun gadgets to like, you yeah. know, get grappling hook to walls and shit. And that's very much what blank man has. But his is like uh you know a toilet plunger and all this crazy shit and it doesn't work too well he's like having to you know lower himself down an elevator and it takes like 20 minutes to drop down a foot you know that type yeah. of shit yeah really ratchet man and uh <laughs> he's he's a makeshift batman yeah, yeah ratchet created- man i mean that's honestly like that's what i we should call him that it's a ratchet man steve that's the new man. ghetto superhero you hear that stanley um now he even has like a, a little robot assistant that he created. J5. J5. Uh, I want to say Tony Cox was J5. Tony uh, Cox? From, from Bad Santa? Because Tony really? Cox was in the movie. It, like the in the credits, it says uh, Tony Cox as Midget Man. And I don't remember a Midget Man. So I'm assuming that maybe John, if Tony Cox is in the credits, maybe he was in that, in that uh, robot get up. Maybe because, but J5 is, you know, again, a very ghetto looking thing, but very useful. He seems to be a jack of all trades as far as a robot goes. He'll deliver you some cool beverages and he might defuse a bomb or two or at least like contain explosions. So he's got a lot of uses. And again, this speaks to Daryl's um, ingenuity. He can turn anything into something useful, I guess. He even has a pom pom for hair. <laughs> He does. He, he's got like a he, remember Johnny five from uh, short circuit. Short circuit. This Fuck is yeah. like the ghetto. This is the ghetto Johnny. Five. I mean, his name J five. So, I mean, there you go. He can't even, he's so ghetto. He couldn't even afford Johnny. So yeah, those extra <laughs> syllable. Those, yeah. Couldn't afford an extra syllable. Um, th- and this is Greg Kinnear's uh, feature film debut. He had an appearance on this movie. Um, really? And Greg, yeah, Greg Kinnear, he was like a, a talk show host because there was an Arsenio cameo. And uh, I think Greg Kinnear was another because they're talking about the blank man craze. The, oh, my oh, God. Okay. And, and, and I think Greg Kinnear was one of those hosts where they're like flipping through the channels. And, uh, you know, for a while, Greg Kinnear, he was my Hugh Grant. I thought like, man, what? Well, he's fucking stale, boring. But then he did that film, man. Uh, 
that he played the guy from Hogan's Heroes. It was like a biopic of the guy. Oh, no, from focus. Hogan. That movie was fucked up, dude. It was. It, that guy lived a fucked up life. But like it was such a good movie and he played a great role. I was like, you know what? You're safe now, Greg Kinnear. You're OK. All those other fucking Lifetime Hallmark movies you can make. That movie right there saves you. Yeah, I also I mean, he was the first host of Talk Soup. If you remember that show on E before uh, John the guy Henson, Jim John, Henson. Before John Henson. No, not Jim Henson. Yeah, John Henson. You're right. You're right. John Henson. He was before that guy. He was the first wow. host of it ever. Actually. You're right. I forget about that, bro. <clears throat> Damn. It was that. But dude, that autofocus movie, wow, good. Super. Because it's all about like how that guy and some guy named Wes Craven, who was not the movie director, would like film pornos and like beat off to them. And like, yeah. just a very, I don't know why me and Jordan watched that together, but we did. It's, and I remember it's a good just, movie. It is, but it's, it's bizarre. It definitely is one of those where if you don't know what you're getting into, it's not. It's weird. It's just a, but again, the guy from Hogan's Heroes, I guess, was getting some pussy. So, you know, salute to that guy, uh, sidetracking the fuck's alley. But I didn't realize uh, Greg Kinnear was actually in this. I didn't clock that. Yeah, man. But back to the elevator, Steve. So, Blank Man's on the scene. Uh, this is the only real thing I remembered from this movie because as he's delivering a baby, um, Kevin is like at the head and Blank Man's at the, where the baby's coming out, where the baby maker is, and he's going, it's so ugly. And that's the only thing I remembered from this whole movie is like watching it as a kid is just laughing my ass off at that. Um, they deliver the baby successfully. So again, blank man, he's two for two. He's killing it. Yeah. He's, he's serving the, the neighborhood. And now there's like people around, they see blank man, the neighborhood sees him for the first time. And everyone's like, who are you? Like, who is this guy? And yeah. uh, um, he doesn't have an answer. And Kevin's like, oh, sorry, ma'am. He's just gone blank. So the lady's <laughs> like, oh, he, she misheard him. Is like, oh, blank man. Thank you so much, blank man. You're a hero. And that's it. That's how he gets his name. This is like where he gets his name. And this is the start of blank man's career. So um, Daryl takes it in. He becomes blank man. And uh, he just starts basically earning a name for himself in the neighborhood and becomes like that guy. So everyone's putting up like little posters of him. And this is probably where you were saying Greg Kinnear is like talking about the blank man craze because he very yeah. much becomes like the symbol of good in Metro City, I guess. And, uh, you know, his brother, Kevin, he's feeling a certain way, you know, because it's like, man, he'd been shitting on his brother the whole time, his whole life about being a nerd or just being caught up in this fantasy world about being a superhero. But it's coming into fruition. It's starting to it, it's starting to sprout his his dreams, his goals, his aspirations of being a protector of the block. And Kevin's just like, man, this shit is getting out of hand. Hold up. Hold, hold the fuck up. Uh, yeah. But when he goes to work. It, it, it's even worse because they're talking about it, obviously, because it's the talk of the town. And like, how can we get a hold of Blank Man? And even his crush, Kimberly Johns with a Z, uh, she was like, man, I, I, would, I would do anything. I, like, whose cock do I have to blow in order to get a hold of this <laughs> Blank Man? And mm -hmm. the dag is just like, OK, Spidey sense is tingling. So he's like, you know what? I, I think I know how to get a hold of this Blank Man, you know, uh, you know. I got some I got some connections. Let me work so, on it. <laughs> yeah. And he, he hooks up the interview. They they do an interview with Blank Man, him and Kimberly Johns. And uh, she comes out of it feeling just smitten. She's like, oh, he's probably the greatest man I've ever known. Yeah. And yeah, Dag is like, bitch, how the fuck? Like this motherfucker uh, walking around in long underdraws. Why the fuck? Huh? He's yeah. not saying that, but he's wearing the thing. same costume we used to wear when we were kids playing superhero. Yeah, what the fuck? And also, put on. we, we kind of glossed over this. So, before the interview, Dag comes home to ask if Daryl will do the interview as Blank Man. He's like, it's, "This is a no brainer. You're going to do this. Yeah. Like, I'm about to get some pussy off this. So please." And Daryl's like, "I can't do that. This isn't." He's so altruistic, Steve. He didn't do this for the views. You know what I'm saying? He's just doing this to help the community. For the people. So, uh, 
Dag's obviously like, dude, what the fuck? Come on, man. Like, I'm in here. You got this place trashed. There's fucking VCR parts everywhere. And um, you got to help me out. Like, we got we, no money. We got to do something here. And uh, fucking uh, Daryl's like, hey, actually, you know what? One of the people sent me fucking $2,000. And uh, Dag's like, oh, hell yeah. We're about to make some money off this. Where's that money? And he said, oh, you know what? I said I didn't want it. Just send me your dirty VCR part so I can make more gadgets. So that throws Kevin, Dag, whatever you want to call him, into a rage. And he tells Daryl, you got to get this shit the fuck out of here. Fuck this superhero shit. This is all bullshit. Get this out of here and uh, clean this place up. And you're going to do the interview. Um, so he actually has to go find a blank cave which yeah. he, he looks at a bunch of options. Eventually he finds like, I think a, a abandoned subway stop. And that's where he takes Kimberly Johns. This is like this crazy subway station. He actually has a motorcycle hooked up on the uh, subway track. So it can like move in there and get to his thing. And it's like this whole thing at this point. So Kimberly Johns, you know, sees this guy come up, gets on the bike and is like you said, smitten. She even kisses this motherfucker, which uh, Daryl is so un- you know, familiar with women at all. A kiss, a touch, he's going to bust. Oh, yeah. hey, hey. <laughs> oh, you know, it's very much uh, a bust scenario. But he gets a kiss and then he's it's like um, Stefan or Kel type shit where he's this nerdy yeah. guy. But as soon as he puts on this, he don't even need to hop in a, a machine, Steve. He just has to put on some fucking underwear and a mask and he's Johnny fucking uh, romance, you know, Johnny Bravo in this bitch without the <laughs> hair. God, dog. So there again. So then uh, that's what really kind of sends uh, Kevin off the rails because he's like, you got a kiss from her. Yeah. So not only is his brother now eclipsing him as a superhero, now he's taking his pussy. Taking his broad. I mean, that's tough. That's a tough one to swallow. Yeah, man, uh, Robin Givens with them DSLs. Man, she's got a pretty mouth. Mm. And uh, dude, Damon <sighs> Wayne's just—he's had some luck with his leading ladies too. Where I gotta just—he's like Adam Sandler, where he, they know how to pick them sometimes. Where it's like you did this on purpose, you son of you lucky son of a bitch. Yeah, it's too, man. Yeah, it's too. <laughs> it's a it's a my wife and kids production. I mean, so Robin Givens, she wants. She wants a, an exclusive with blank man in bed at this point. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. She, does, she wants that blank dick. So <laughs> uh, <coughs> they um, they keep doing their thing. Blank man is basically like, again, famous now. Everybody knows about him. And Manelli knows about him, too, which isn't good. Um, it turns out also in the midst of all this that we find out that Manelli is either in cahoots with the mayor who was the one that their grandmother was supporting. He's now the mayor. Yeah. Um, and I don't know. It's kind of confusing because he like shows up and I guess they're in cahoots. But the mayor seems to be having some second thoughts about that. And uh, he basically tells Manelli, yo, fuck off. I'm going to get you arrested. I'm going to tell the D.A. to like put a warrant out for your arrest. And uh, in the. So Manelli has like some sort of vendetta out against him. Blank man's now like sort of in the mix in this. And uh, the mayor has like an event planned soon thereafter for blank man. It's like a blank man appreciation day, you know? Yeah. And uh, it's going to be held at a bank. And uh, there's like some issue with money in Metro city. So there's this whole thing going on and we get there. Uh, blank man shows up. The mayor's there. And we they go into the bank to open it. I, I I'm on from I forget what that is, so I apologize. I'm not remembering that part of it. But then Manelli's squad like locks everybody, like the mayor and blank man in this bank so that they can like do a heist and sort of fuck shit up. And it's very this is where it gets very Batman Adam West because they get in the, the bank. And Minnelli's guys are there and they're like, what the fuck's going on? And Mine- like all of a sudden there, there's an explosion and Minnelli just comes up out of the ground, like on a platform and is like, ah, uh-huh. <laughs> you know, it's, it's very over the top, but uh, they yeah. get locked in here. And then the mayor gets attached to the bank vault door 
with just every ounce of C4 that's in Metro City. It's not looking great. Yeah, man. It's it's very Joker from Adam West days. I it's so my like he if you would have told me that he was penguin and that was an Adam like a scene from Adam West, just him coming out of the floor, it would have been perfect. It was fucking hilarious. Even Kendra was like, what the fuck is going on now? Like, how did this happen? Yeah, yeah I mean, it is, around this point, I was getting lost myself, man. I was like, okay, time to solve some crosswords. But, <laughs> you know, overall, I love the movie because I'm a fan of everybody involved. Um, you know, Dag, and we just mentioned Dag last week, man. You know, Dag had a decent 94. It wasn't a Jim Carrey 94, but he just did in the army now with our buddy Paulie Shore, buddy. He did that. And then the very next week, he did Blank Man with his buddy Damon. <laughs> um, dude, when was he? When what did Jumanji come out? Because I'm trying to like do the timeline. Cause I mean, 90s, this motherfucker was really killing it in a way that I don't think I was aware of back then. I believe we were in high school. We were, it was either eighth grade or ninth grade when Jumanji yeah. came out, but it, it was in the nineties though. I mean, it was close to this uh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, it was made him not the same year, but it just, I mean, the guy's so talented, of course he was killing it, but as in regards to this movie, like, you know, I'm not, I don't think it's any surprise that blank man ends up winning it all guys. He becomes a superhero. Even Kevin, uh, becomes, uh, his sidekick basically. And he, he doesn't even get a name. He's just the other guy. He's very much there's no character arc. He doesn't like get out of that. He just becomes second fiddle to his brother. And uh, I I didn't like this movie when I was younger. At least I didn't remember it and liking it. But I. Good movie, fun movie. I enjoyed it. Yeah, man, um, it, it's it's worth a watch. Um, it, it's not a, I wouldn't say a timeless classic, but it's worth a watch if you're a fan of any of the parties involved. On the next Oprah when dad leaves mom for the housekeeper. Um, but that following year on August 19th, on in 1995, Mike Tyson returns to the ring after serving three years in prison and DQs Peter McNeely in 89 seconds. Uh, I remember watching this when it came out, man. Uh, I was in Columbus visiting my cousin and my, a group of my cousins from Sandusky. We went to Columbus for that weekend. And uh, the guy... Uh, who had who had the the fight? He had one of those boxes where you can get all the nude flicks. You can get any pay per view nice. boxing match, wrestling match. Um, that was a thing back then, man. And we were watching it. Just the little cousins, the the man, the dad, or whatever. He wasn't in the house. So before the match, we definitely were watching some of those skin flicks when we were, you know, uh, we were eleven and twelve and shit. Uh, but I remember this being a big deal because it was Mike Tyson coming out of jail for the, and this is his first fight. And Peter McNeely, this Joey Buttafuoco motherfucker, uh, he was talking shit, uh, big shit. And I, you know, I get it. Like, this is what sells. You got to talk shit, even if you're not confident. Uh, and he was talking big shit. Um, and on YouTube, uh, there's this classic fucking promo that Mike Tyson is struggling to shoot for this fight. And he's he's sparring in uh, in the gym and it's Don King and some of the, the camera guys. And he's just shooting for these different stations. Uh, catch me and Peter McNeely on Comcast uh, radio station. Uh, catch me knock out Peter McNeely on uh, Comcast Turner cable system cable. Com and he's just <laughs> and he's struggling. It's some of the funniest shit. No, Mike, say it's Comcast Cable Vision. Ca catch me on Comcast Cable Vision systems. No, Mike, it's Comcast yeah. Cable. Comcast Cable Vision. Mike, stations. you dumb motherfucker. Oh, shit. <laughs> I, vision I, dude, stations. Like, people don't really remember this. Like, I maybe like older or younger generations, but you watch this uh, because you had access to that satellite dish. But yeah. what year was this again? In that, the summer of 95. 95. So, yeah. yeah, I was like 12. We were in Ohio at this point. And even, dude, anybody was getting this because this was Mike Tyson coming out of jail. Everyone was waiting to see him fight again. So, like, that's something you got to keep in mind that looking at Peter McNeely, it's like, why is that guy? Why is Mike Tyson fighting that plumber? You know, or it's that moving guy. And uh, but you didn't know who that guy was, but you knew who fuck Mike Tyson was and you wanted to yeah. see that dude whoop ass. But I think what I remember is that that excitement quickly just went to shit because it only lasted less than a minute. So it was like over before oh. it got started. 
Oh, man. Yeah. If you paid money for that, I'm sure you were disappointed, man. But what <clears> would you expect, man? Uh, the guy looks like he looks at UPS or some shit. And look it's at Mike, Mike Tyson. Tyson, dude. Look at him right there. Look at that. Just kill. He just looks like a killer right there. I, I don't. I don't remember what Peter McNeely was doing, like what the buildup was, like what his career was before he fought Mike Tyson. But he didn't have a career after that. No, this is his only level of relevance, man. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it lasted 89 seconds. And it's just like, dude, I cannot wait for him to shut this dude up. Um, and, you know, it was refereed by Mills Lane, the legendary Mills Lane, man, from a celebrity death match and whatnot. Uh, it, it, it grossed $96 million, uh, including that, a then dude, record. then. Ninety six yeah. million then. I mean, play now. What does a pay per view hope to get? Like a hundred and some million in buys, probably something like that. Hopefully, uh, it so, it was purchased by one point five one point fifty two million American homes, man. Dude, I, that's what I'm saying. Like in white ass Ohio, like <clears throat> boxing matches to me, it's just like a guy thing. Like it's always been a guy thing. It's never really unless it's Mike Tyson or somebody of that nature, it's not everybody wanting to get it. It's a bunch of guys or maybe a bar, but every, it was like the Super Bowl. You go yeah. in Perrysburg, people be having house parties to watch this shit. So um, this is when Mike Tyson was a killer still. He's coming out of jail just looking straight fucking yoked as fuck. So I just, in my mind, just remember being so excited that you were finally going to get to see Mike Tyson. I mean, we were young. So I don't know that I fully appreciated Iron Mike Tyson at his prime, but I was old enough to appreciate wanting to see him when I was 12 because it was just like he was that guy. No doubt, man. Now, that in 1998, on August 19th, South Park is airing the episode Chef's Chocolate Salty Balls. Hollywood Big Shots try to turn South Park into another Sundance. However, they wreak havoc on the town's ecosystem, which causes Mr. Hanky to die, our favorite turd. <clears throat> this is one of like one of the most memorable episodes of South Park to me just because of the song of all time. Yeah. <clears throat> they came out with a CD of music that I remember back in around this time after this episode came out, mainly centered on this song. I mean, this was a huge like everybody knew this in school type things. You came home and or you came to school just fucking singing this shit. Um but yeah, we're in South Park and Sundance. It's just, it's getting tired, Steve. It's time to take over a new small town and get all of Hollywood's elite to someplace else so they can have another film festival. So South Park's, they're, they're number one on that list. Yeah, um, because, uh, you know, if they can't live in a small, quaint mountain town, no one will. No. I mean, Hollywood's got to have its, it's got to have a taste. So. Yeah, and there's like a guy specifically who's like the the guy, the movie guy that's like evil trying to to go to each of these little small towns and suck up as much money and joy as he can. Um, and, you know, everybody sort of kind of seems excited about it. Cartman, not so much because he doesn't like uh, these artsy fartsy movies, Steve. He's, they're all no. gay cowboys eating pudding. Yeah, I don't want that. It's facts, so. though. And, and the guy is actually Robert Redford, who apparently didn't care for this episode, obviously. Uh, you know, he, he voiced his opinion about it. Um, but he's, you know, like you said, he's like, uh, it, it's uh, Sundance was just getting too stale. It's uh, sushi restaurants, upscale clothing stores, $25 parking, and Liam Neeson. <laughs> but chefs, he's all in because he's a chef. So, I mean, this gives him an opportunity to just sell some product. And uh, he's selling just some chocolate. He's selling his chocolate goods at this point. And his first yeah. product is called Fudgems. You want some chocolate? Fudge. Little cookies with fudge in the middle. Yeah. And I mean, you chick fucking with her, fudge her. And get some mm -hmm. fudgems. So he's out there and he's very much doing what I want to do. Finding some opportunity and making an extra buck. You know what I mean? Like, man. Yeah, it's Americana, baby. 
Uh, he even has his double chocolate cookies called Fudge This, the low calorie cookies called Go Fudge Yourself, and even the all natural. I don't really give a flying fudge, but that's not fitting for the Ellie Elitist uh, palates. Uh, they prefer couscous and steamed octopus wraps, but Chef's got all the cookies. He even has I Just Want and Fudge Your Mama. <laughs> that was the one, Steve. Please, can somebody release these? Please. Trey and Matt, let's get on, let's get some fucking. Uh merchandise out here i'll buy some i would just went and fudge your mama cookies right now and, and the the festival moves to south park and the the boys go in and they watching witness to denial a sexual exploration piece by candace butch <laughs> candace butch dude yeah it, i and mean one of the these ladies... motherfuckers are crazy as fuck dude because what was that movie about steve it was just two lesbians just like about the scissor, Sex. basically. <laughs> yeah, and uh, one of the ladies is wearing a little fair T-shirt, and and fair is spelled the wrong way. It's like bus fair. It's spelled F A R E. Um, <laughs> I fucking love those guys. Uh, <laughs> no, fucking dude. so genius, man. <laughs> and uh, cut to Kyle, who's on the toilet taking a shit, uh, and he hears a familiar voice. Is it you, the Christmas poo? How could this be? I mean, it's coming from somewhere, but he he's not popping out, Steve. It's just like these it's echoes of Mr. Hanky. Something's wrong. Yeah, man. Oh, it's not it, Christmas time. Why is this piece of shit coming out? Yeah, it's August. What the fuck? Um, <laughs> and then so now Chef has a new concoction. We find out called Chef's Chocolate Salty Balls. Mm. And Cartman loves his balls. Uh, I love your balls, Chef. And then you just want to put them in your mouth, Steve. You do, man. They're chocolate and they're salty. And uh, the, the the boys, or at least Kyle, he hears that voice again. He hears it from the grill of the sewer. And he's like, man, I don't know. I think I hear him again. And so the boys, they go into the sewer uh, reluctantly. And because Kyle thinks he hears Mr. Hanky's voice coming from there. But while they're down there, they see Mr. Garrison with Mr. Stick and he's wearing snorkel stuff. And he asked the kids if they knew how to file a police report. They say no. And then he goes on about his way. <laughs> um, <laughs> but they find Mr. Hanky or at least Mr. Hanky finds them as he's sailing the seas of the sewer water in a French fry box. And he's a little under the weather. Uh, the influx of all the new people coming to South Park is ruining the sewer's fragile ecosystem. And all the Cali people eating their grilled snail and stir-fried pigeon pellets and sassafras au jus and buckwheat patties is just killing his friends, his turdy, shitty friends. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, there's a call to action. Like, we got to save our <clears throat> favorite Christmas poop. Uh, the, these festival goers, they're just ruining. Uh, I can't live off rice cake poop, Kyle. I need something yeah. more with, I need a steak. I need some chicken McNug. I need that shit. So yeah. all this hell's food, it's drying Mr. Hanky up. Uh, his little turdlet kids, they might die. You know, it's very concerning. So the boys have to get back up to the surface and try to talk some kind of sense into these LA people who not only are in the midst of this <clears throat> film festival, they're also in the midst of shitting on Fred Savage over and over again, which I didn't get. I, I don't get I that. And I don't appreciate because Fred Savage is one of the goats of this child acting shit. He's a treasure of the United States. He's a treasure of the 90s, the 80s. And, you know, to, even to this day, Steve, the motherfucker won't stop working and doing cool shit. So I he's don't like support that. But I do find it funny when they're like, fuck Fred Savage. And he's just there like crying in the theater. <laughs> yeah, dude, I actually want that shirt. I am Fred Savage because he <laughs> fucking rocks. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and Kyle is telling the people about his uh, his magical turd friend who like, hey, you, you got to hear him out, man. Like you, you look you the climate change in the sewer is fucking up him and his family. And they're like, all right, kid, we'll entertain this bullshit. So he has Mr. Hanky in a box. But by the time he opens it up, Mr. Hanky has already been dried up and has died. Uh, great but, piece of shit, kid. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what he said. But lo and behold. We have Chef with his chocolate salty balls. Uh, Mr. Hanky is on life support. He gives them those chocolate salty balls and it revives them. And it just then see, it doesn't only revive him, Steve. It supercharges him. So but at first he has to like stick up for himself. And uh, Robert Redford, in a rage, just grabs the turd and throws him up against the wall and kills him. 
funniest um, part of the fucking one episode. One thing we yeah. did like go over that I thought was funny was that when Kyle is telling this audience of like uh, executives about Mr. Hankey, instead of oh, wanting yeah. to help, all they want to do is buy the option to make the movie. And, Me and Mr. <laughs> Hankey, yeah. Uh, they, you know, one of the sleazy execs approaches Cartman singularly and is like, look, man, like I can see you're the brains. So why don't yeah. we strike up a deal? I'll, I'll get this and we'll make this movie. So he buys the option and they actually make a movie overnight with yeah. Tom Hanks and a chimpanzee who is now Mr. Hanky. They've, they flipped the yeah. script a little bit. <laughs> Which is what they do a lot in Hollywood. And uh, I, I didn't appreciate the shitting on Tom Hanks. That's never cool. Tom no, Hanks is I, another... I, you know, I, I get it. You got to go. You got to just like punch up every once in a while. Hmm, hey, you got to go. Yeah. You, you know, when you're batting at like 750 or whatever South Park's batting 99 out of the 100. I get it. And I find it funny. You know, they shit on Matt Damon. I kind of like Matt Damon. So, yeah. um, <clears throat> another national but, treasure again. So now we're back. Mr. Hanky again, he comes, they're watching this movie. Uh, Kyle brings Mr. Hanky. He dies. He's revived by the, uh, balls, ch- uh, chef's balls. He's killed. But Chef's balls are this are that good, Steve, that he just pops a couple more in Mr. Hanky's mouth. And it's like making it's like when Mighty Morphin Power Rangers make the Megazord. It turns him yeah. into like a poo magician and he goes full Fantasia poo yeah. all over this town. So yeah, he's he's creating whirling waves of shit, overflowing eddies of shit. Uh, and he just eradicates or should I say defecates on all the film festival attendants, man. He, like the wave just takes all these fuck boy fucking LA people out of South Park, which, you know, everyone realizes that <clears throat> that's a good thing. You know, thank God that we didn't let these people take over our town. But now, like, the mayor's like, well, great. Now this town's just covered in shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's that to deal with. But one thing that we can all uh, agree with that we got out of it, like, that South Park got out of this is. Chef's salty chocolate salty balls, and then the theme song to Chef's chocolate salty balls, because that was the main thing of this episode, Steve. Mm. If you ever need a big mm. pick me up, just stick his balls in your mouth, which is obviously very true. It, it revived a piece of shit. So <laughs> yeah, so who knows? It could revive a lot of those pieces of shit at these film festivals. And mm. like I said before, uh, Robert Redford, he was very offended by the episode, which spoofed the Sundance Film Festival. Trey Parker and Matt Stone made this episode as revenge for Cannibal, the musical, or Hannibal, the musical, not being picked for the festival when they submitted it in 94. And if you've never seen that movie, it's really, uh, I mean, for a student film, it's amazing to watch it. And it's funny as fuck. I had that for a while. That, that was in the uh, collection. I remember watching it with you and yeah. Jordan, man. And uh, it, it's funny that they uh, Cartman mentions the gay cowboys eating pudding because this episode aired seven years before Brokeback Mountain. And it was one year after the publication of the short story of the same name by uh, Annie Pruel. And yeah, when they show that movie, too, it's it's hilarious because it's like, oh, God, what, what is that pudding? Yeah, let me have a little spoonful. And then you just hear like, oh, God, oh, God. Yeah. And it, it, Trey Parker and Matt Stone, they were asked in an interview uh, about this. Uh, this was after Brokeback Mountain was released. And uh, and Parker said, if there's pudding eating in there, we're going to sue. And Stone claimed that uh, we're not prophets, but Cartman is. Isn't that wild, though, that I mean, I get that there I, I don't know if they read the book or if that was like a famous thing, but seven years before <laughs> that's fucking South Park did shit. it. South Park did it. <laughs> and there, there might be a pudding eating up scene in that movie. I had to watch that movie in film school and I, they're very well. They could have been eating pudding right before that butt fuck scene. I, I don't remember. Really? So. Man, well, uh, any callbacks? Honorable uh, missions, takeaways, Matthew? Yeah, Steve, we talked about this. We removed it from discussion on the episode, but um, there was a movie that came out on August 19th and 93 called Killing Zoe, uh, and it was directed by Roger Avery. Uh, it does star uh, Pulp Fiction alum Eric Stoltz. Um, but the reason I wanted to bring this up is just sort of not a call to action, but just to like bring it up as an aside was that, you know, you and I are very much fans of Quentin Tarantino, and uh, when you read about his career, you know, he worked in a uh, 
a movie rental place in Manhattan yeah. Beach near where I live now. Uh, and he actually worked with this guy, Roger Avery, and they wrote yeah. and they pontificated about movies and they dreamed before they either of them became successful in Hollywood of, you know, kind of doing what we're doing, like working together and becoming successful as a team. But then obviously Quentin Tarantino went on to write Reservoir Dogs, True Romance, Natural Born Killers. Uh, you know, he made Reservoir Dogs and he made Pulp Fiction. Uh, but the, the point of contention about Pulp Fiction was that Roger Avery wrote the section like Bruce Willis's section with the boxer Mitch, I believe. Yeah. Butch. 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 Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Butch. And uh, there was never any credit given to him for quite some time. He was given a special writing credit for that part of it. But it, I think it drove a wedge in between them. Um, mm. So I only brought up Killing Zoe, which is a good movie. I've seen it. Uh, it's well written. It's about a, a cab driver in America. Uh, or, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. A cab driver sets American Zed up with Zoe in his Paris hotel. Um, she's an art student with a day job at a bank. And uh, Zed, it's basically about this guy Zed and Zoe and a bank robbery. It's like a crime movie. Um, and wasn't wasn't Zed one of the characters in Pulp Fiction too? He was in that. He was in the Bruce Willis thing. So there's a name there. Yeah. So there's like a lot of weirdness. They've since made yeah. up, and I think have like sort of mended the fences on this, which is why Roger Avery was given a credit eventually on Pulp Fiction after um, the fact. Yeah, after the fact. So just interesting, man. It's interesting. You see, like some of these movies come out, and you don't realize like the 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 story you hear about how it's made sometimes is different. And this Roger Avery guy, he's a really good director and writer. And I think sort of di he might've, he might've had his career slowed down a little bit because of Quentin Tarantino and his rise. Cause I think it was sort yeah. of everybody, you know, his thing was always written and directed by this is a Quentin Tarantino joint. And yeah. I think his main reason he left him off was to maintain that. You know what I yeah. mean? Uh, make it seem like I did the, I did it the Robert Rodriguez way where I, yeah. I wrote, directed, produced and all of that, man, edited. And uh, it. I, I like to get my facts straight. You said uh, summer of 93. It was August 1994. Uh, the same I'm day. Sorry. As Quint, man. I'm looking at the page on IMDb. I just went off that. I apologize. Oh, good, man. All good. <clears throat> sorry, man. But no, if you haven't seen it, check it out. It's like a good 90s crime movie. And again, it's interesting when you think about that in relation to uh, Quentin Tarantino and everything. He might have even helped get that movie made, you know, with his association because they it was well known that they were friends and stuff. But it's one of those cool side facts. I just thought I'd bring it up. Uh, and on that same day, uh Andre was released and it, that was about the, the little girl with the seal. And I don't know why that was even made into a movie, but it was the nineties. Um, because yeah. free Willie got made Steve. And they were like, what can we, we can't afford a fucking whale. Can we get a seal? Okay. We're good. Let's do that. <laughs> are, are you sure it was 90? I mean, I don't know. Cause I'm looking it up now. It might've been 93. I, <clears throat> I just Don't sometimes go off of what IMDb says. I didn't want to like sidetrack and look it up. It might be 93 or 94 might. It, maybe it's a home release and a theatrical release. I don't know. It's possible. But Andre, I never heard of this shit. Yeah, man. It's uh, I remember it when it came out and I just, yeah, it was 94. But uh, Andre, it just like... Even as a kid, I'm like, what the fuck? A seal? Like, it's not even a fun fucking animal. They're fucking boring. I mean, it's kind of more dangerous. I th Like, seals, I feel like, will attack you more than a killer whale would. I feel like killer whales are really? supposed to be, like, more, like, dolphinish in most. I, I don't know. I've, now I'm just speaking out. This is some white boy well, fucking bro science. So don't even listen to this shit. Well, if that's the case, that's the Andre I want to see. Like, you hear that, Hollywood? I know y'all <laughs> watching. Uh, let's let's do a rebo to Andre where seals are clubbing little girls to death. And uh, yeah, <clears throat> have you ever seen that video? It's like a, a famous, just one of those like internet videos where chicks like sitting in a marina, you know, where they like put boats on docks and stuff, and she's just sitting there, and then all of a sudden, like a seal comes out of the water, bites her arm, and just drags her into the water. I mean, that's all that happens. It lets her go, but I was, you never really think of that. You know, seals are very kind of cute looking. 
That's but they're, they're huge. Presented. Yeah. You know, they're big fucking animals. So they're, they're gross looking too. With whiskers yeah, and green, shit. They all look fucking like they, I mean, they'd probably reek like dead fish. So, I mean, that's not something I want to smell. So, and, or be around. I just don't, man, I'm not, I live near the ocean, dude. You ain't going to get me in the fucking ocean without a lot of drugs or I, I, I'm too like scared of what's below the surface. I don't blame you, man. I can't swim. But hey, stereotypical black guy. Uh, <laughs> any other honorable mentions or takeaways? Um, I mean, really, that was it. Other than that, and just like giving a shout out to fucking uh, Damon Wayans and David Allen Greer again, just because I keep seeing things that I, you know, we'll watch movies like this or even no. I watched Mo Money recently, like that movie. There's just these movies that these guys were parts of that you don't really remember that much, but they're just fucking quality ass movies, you know? So yeah. just salute to these guys for being like 30 years deep and still like to this day, they're still killing it. You know, like yeah. it's, it's cool to see. I'm glad to see that. And and even to the point where the, the next generation, his, his son, Damon Wayans Jr. has made a name for himself. Well, obviously, uh, not literally because he took his name from his dad, but uh, he was in the, uh, the show uh, New Girl. Um, oh yeah i mean he's had dude they put him in movies too and it's just like it's a different time like you put out scary movie before and there were just more people going to theaters you put out dance movie and it's not as good as scary movie in my opinion but it's still like got that wayne spoof energy to it and i think i he was great in new girl he's been in a lot of shit he was in another movie called let's be cops with, yeah, I remember that. I think the guy from New Girl, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, the other the other guy. Yeah. Um, and that was funny, you know. He, he's making it. It's I, I like to me anybody who can come out of that Wayne's family, like just block that family in general now and yeah. sort of become successful just on their own, you know, yeah. is pretty impressive because it's just that's a big umbrella to get out of. If you're not being in a Wayne's yeah. movie, he was on New Girl and shit. So it's like to me, it's cool to see, man. Those guys, it's just a really talented fucking family no doubt, salute man. those motherfuckers and more importantly i don't want to forget this call of action listen to our latest interview me and mad g we popped up on our new friends show uh b3f man with joey and steven i love that name uh but like man we had a good time and it's now available on spotify google Podcasts, on all of that and we're going to have it in our stories so uh check that out it's available now on audio and on video it'll be available on youtube wednesday and uh, what's going and on Steve, with Crush Gas? I, I got one other one because I would be remiss. Yeah. Our buddy um, gave us a sh- shout out to uh, get uh, this out yeah. here. Let me get the information up. Um, so Scott Edwards, who we've had on the podcast, great guest, great person. Um, he has a, his podcast and he just had on uh, somebody who I – Absolutely love uh, st- well, he's a stand-up comedian, a, a magic stand-up. Uh, his name's Amazing Jonathan. Yeah. Um, he's been a, the subject of a couple of documentaries because of his success and his subsequent. He's had some health issues that where they actually thought he was going to die. Um, and he's still going through that. But Scott had him on. Scott used to have a comedy club out here on the West Coast. And um, I just the shit. It was a great interview. I listened to it, and if you don't get um, a chance, hold on, my fucking inner. Sorry. Well, it, it's important that we mention the the name of the show. That's what uh, I, Scott- I'm trying to get it up. So it's called the name of the podcast is called Stand Up Comedy. Your host and MC, and that's again with uh, Scott Edwards. And you can go on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, basically anywhere you find podcasts and just type in stand-up comedy, your host and MC. Uh, and that interview is actually out now. Um, so yeah. I would definitely tell everybody, if you like stand-up comedy, Amazing Jonathan is funny as fuck. A wild, funny uh, magic act from the 90s. And even before that, he was very prolific. Uh, he was on Comedy Central. He actually had a career in Australia. He was so good. He translated all the way over there for a while. So if you like stand up, if you like him, if you just, you know, like good podcasts, check that one out. Yeah, man. And we're definitely going to have Scott back because uh, we I read his book. Uh, we, we both read his book, man. And yep. uh, we want to talk about that and just catching up, man. There's so much in comedy that he's seen. Uh, and I love picking the brain of people who have just encountered these 
legendary comedians, man. Yeah. Um, so what's going on with Crush Gasm? Uh, this week we got Nate Jones. He's a musician uh, and he's going to be talking about his, I believe, middle school crush. So this is actually real people, Steve. Like we said, some people like to go with fictional characters with uh, fictional titties and ass. This guy, he went with a real person. So <laughs> to Nate Jones, uh, to very Nate interesting. Jones. Uh, it'll actually already be out by the time you listen to this. It comes out every Wednesday. So check that out, too. What's going on on Over the Culture? Man, uh, this week I'm talking. We talked about uh, Woodstock 94. We talked about Woodstock 99 on what happened in the 90s. But on Over the Culture this week, I'm talking about the OG Woodstock because it happened on August 15th in 69, man, with Creedence Clearwater Revival. Uh, of course, Jimi Hendrix. Uh, there was just countless others, man. The Who. Uh Santana and it, I, I talk about the whole fiasco afterwards man there was at least two fatalities that were recorded uh but you know a lot of people look at that with these rose tinted shades man and they had their their mess too uh literally yeah. because it, it it was muddy in that one it, there was some torrential rain and um yeah man so I'm gonna be talking about that and I'm talking about my car being broken into when I went home um, I, I went to Ohio for my uh, grandfather's funeral. Oh, and, when, and when I got back to Atlanta uh, to pick up my car at the parking lot in the airport, my shit had been rummaged through. They didn't even take anything. They didn't even take shit. I'm like, what? This is Did not they break a good the window or they just opened the door? No. They opened the door and I thought I locked it. I must have not because like the only thing that happened was just a lot of shit on the on the floor and stuff on my seat. And it was like, dude, what do you expect to find in a car in a parking lot of an airport? People don't go out of the town, out of the country and like, oh, you know what? Let me put on my valuables. Let me leave my purse here. Let me, Damn, let me leave my dude, wallet here. So it's that. Just, how to see I that's hate, one that's one that's also baffling because it's like how the fuck you get in there to be you just like take your car in and just look at see what doors you can open on the cars that's fucking yeah, wild dude i'm man fuck all that it's Ill. just isn't that some shit where it's like you already had to go do some shit that's just heartbreaking as it is and then it's you get back and it's like oh thanks ill gotten no. gains man fuck but, all uh, that. So that's that's what's happening on over to culture. But uh, please like, share and subscribe. This is Steve G and Maggie with Happen in the 90s. 90s. Ah. Ah.